So uh, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, today, we're going to be um, going through the uh, third element of the uh, monad module uh, that I've designed here. Um, within the past uh, two discussions on, on monads, we've uh, looked at their relation to adjunctions and how every uh, adjunction gives rise to a monad and every uh, monad is indeed characterized by a family of adjunctions. Uh, we also took a look at uh, monad laws and uh, whence they originate and tried to build up uh, a little bit of intuition as to what they mean in, in practical terms uh, when, when thinking about the two primary uh, natural transformations that um, are of, of foremost interest with the monad, namely uh, the transformation eta, which is uh, variously called a return or pure or unit on the one hand. And then the second one, uh, join, um, which collapses uh, a T of T, a, a, a monad uh, uh, applied as an endofunctor twice uh, and, and as a natural transformation down to uh, to just uh, the, the single uh, in invocation of that endofunctor T itself. So T, T squared, as it were, to T, or T, T composed with T to T. Now, um, today's uh, discussion, uh, also last time we, we did uh, introduce uh, horizontal and vertical uh, composition of natural transformations, which is useful for understanding um, the monad laws. Uh, now, today we're going to um, take a look at a at it from a, a different angle. Uh, again, trying to uh, bring together in a single lecture uh, a sort of uh, more uh, hands-on uh, uh, software engineering oriented approach to looking at particular monads of interest. Um, but at the same time, talk about their category theoretic foundation. And specifically, we're going to be uh, speaking about uh, the relationship between monads on the one hand and monoids on the other. And uh, as we'll see, this will require us to introduce some category theoretic machinery, which is very wide applicability in the form of product categories and in the form of uh, bifunctors. Uh, we'll have a little nod to, um, for, for future reference to profunctors in the bifunctor context, which are a, a close and more interesting cousin of bifunctors. Um, but uh, our, our media quarry is to address the famously uh, opaque uh, utterance that a monad is a monoid in the category of endofunctors. Uh, and we'll see uh, how this emerges naturally from, um, from the notion of a monoid on the one hand, from the notion of the category of endofunctors, this category in which each object is a, is a functor from a given category to itself, hence an endofunctor, and where morphisms are natural transformations between them. Um, and as we'll see, the uh, composition of those morphisms is horizontal uh, composition, and um, this will give rise to a structure uh, in which uh, monoids um, uh, in, in the composition of, of arrows that are standard for monoids, map, uh, map into uh, monads. Uh, so when we have the, this category of endofunctors, um, the monoids in it are, are the monads. And uh, we will uh, we'll see how um, it fits together quite nicely with uh, uh, with monoid laws and monad laws. So uh, monad laws, um, we had seen previously them come out of the laws associated with adjunctions, 
So the monad law is consisting of uh, an associativity law um, and uh, also uh, two triangle um, triangle related laws, uh, which which are associated with unit unitality with with the unit elements. And we'll see that we saw before that those reflected um, the sort of laws that need to come out of adjunctions. But now we'll see that actually there are, they can also be seen alternatively as just monoid laws. Um, monoid laws uh, in a very, very straightforward way, reflective of, um, of how the monad is a, is a monoid. And um, hopefully this will provide us also additional opportunity to give those laws more um, intuition for you. Something I tried to build up a little bit last time, but where I felt I, I fell short of the full potential. And this time I, I've elaborated them a little bit, particularly the associativity law and, and noting uh, some the, uh, the triangle um, the triangle laws associated with monads, um, understanding them in terms of uh, the uh, the operations on on uh, the, the sort of the data structures we commonly deal with from as examples of monads, things like lists um, or things like distributions, etc. So so we'll see that, and then we'll we're going to take a look. Um, uh, at three different ways of defining monads um, that are re each recently popular. Uh, I've given reference to these before, but there's kind of a category theoretic way of characterizing them using uh, join, mu, uh, natural transformation. And uh, I guess all, all three of these have eta, return, unit, pure, whatever you want to call it. They all share that, but they differ what the other operation is. Uh, the category theoretic one has mu for join. Um, one based more on the Kleisley category has Kleisley composition or the fish operator. And the third one, which is the most popular in programming, uh, has a bind. Um, and these are interchangeable. You can find one in terms of the other and we'll see how we can do so. Um, but uh, we'll also go through for a set of different practical monads, um, what mu looks like for them, what eta looks like for them, what bind looks like for them. Um, and hopefully give you a, a feel for um, some ways in which this category theoretic standpoint, understanding whence these natural transformations arise um, can lead to very concrete exemplars of them. Uh, so that's our goals. Uh, those are our goals for today. And uh, this will provide a jumping off point for a couple things. Um, uh, one of them will be uh, profunctors and lenses um, associated with them. Um, so optics more generally, um, which are at once uh, really cool, really useful and theoretically interesting. Uh, we will also use this as a jumping of, off point for applicatives, um, which uh, provide us uh, a kind of an intermediate point between functors and monads, um, which lack some of the flexibility of monads. Monads are these encodings of universal algebras. Um, that, that have uh, tremendous versatility associated with them. Um, but uh, applicatives will be somewhere in between. They offer a lot of power, but, um, uh, but they uh, also uh, provide some, some extra levels of guarantees which can support uh, uh, efficient operations and, uh, and which can be uh, easier uh, to apply in, in some cases. Um, we will uh, we'll also see that applicatives and monads um, have some common substructure in certain respects. And um, we'll, we'll uh, take a look at that. For example, pure, um, the pure operation ends up 
appearing in both, although traditionally it's been called pure with applicatives. So um, uh, we'll be going there. And, and uh, as it turns out, what we introduce in the first part of this session with uh, product categories and monoidal functors uh, will be key for applicatives because there we'll be dealing with lax monoidal functors. Um, these kind of loosey-goosey uh, monoidal functors that um, aren't strict, but, but provide a, um, uh, an extra degree of flexibility atop monoidal functors. Um, I shouldn't say they're loosey-goosey. They're, they're just, um, they're not as uh, pinned down as, as uh, strict uh, monoidal functors uh, would be. But um, they turn out to be, these lax monoidal functors turn out to be equivalent in Haskell to, uh, to applicatives. So uh, we won't go all the way there, but um, this will lay the groundwork for that. Um, and uh, that will you know, set us uh, in a direction to kind of move beyond an adjunction focused um, uh, perspective. Although all these things can be related back to, uh, to adjunctions. And we may return back to home base as it were for, for the adjunction. Okay. So that's that's a bit of the plan for uh, today, and uh, and a, a sneak preview of the next few sessions. Um, okay, so I had suggested you uh, review some videos. Um, uh, much of the earliest material in this uh, is taken, is adapted from some of the exposition in uh, this programming with categories lecture, lecture fifteen, um, and. Uh, you know, Bartosz also talks about um, about mono, uh, monads as monoids in the category of endofunctors, and we'll uh, we'll be trying to tighten up some aspects of his exposition and, and address it. But it's it's worth viewing if you haven't. Okay, so uh, I mentioned we need to introduce some category theoretic um, uh, machinery, as it were, uh, and. Um, one of the key constructs here um, uh, is what is called a product category. And, um, you know, I wasn't even sure I should, I should dwell on this, but it's a little bit of an interesting thing. And it, it firms up some notions about, um, in concrete terms, what we're dealing with when we're dealing with bifunctors. So look, given two categories C and D, we can construct a product category C times D, okay? And the idea is that any object in C times D is a, is a pair of objects, one from C, category C, and one from category D. So C times D is a category. Um, it's a category with objects. C as objects, D as objects, and C times D as objects. Uh, C times D has objects that are simply the objects of C paired with an object, an object of C and an object of D. And you get that for all possible objects of C and all, all possible objects of D. All these pairs of, of, of objects uh, drawn from E. Now that's kind of interesting, but where it becomes more interesting is when we have a morphism, when we consider morphisms, because after all, every category we have morphisms and, and um, Category C and D of morphisms, and presumably those are rec those are reflected in the morphisms associated with C cross D. Um, this this category of pairs, um, and indeed it is. So if we have a morphism in C and we have a morphism in D, these are just the Hom sets, right? The set of all things going between C and C prime, and I'm referring to a particular one here. Um, uh, if we have Amorphism going between C and C prime and C and, and between D and D prime and D, uh, then this means there is a morphism in C cross D. And it's in fact, um, if and only if this condition is met, we have a morphism in C cross D going from the object C, this should be. Uh, this should be, okay, this is a, a bug. Uh, this should be C comma D to uh, C, uh, C prime comma uh, D prime. Okay, um, so the idea is that um, 
we need amorphism from C to C prime and amorphism from D to D prime, and those induce amorphism from the pairing of C and D to the pairing of C prime and D prime. Um, now, I've illustrated this for the particular case of where the product category is being taken of a category with itself. So D is, is C essentially. And we deal with that a lot. This is a very common case. Either it's C cross C or C op cross C, um, where C op is just C with the arrows flipped around, um, the morphisms flipped around. So, um, oh my gosh, oh, this is horrible. Oh my gosh, this is, um, okay, now, now I'm in real trouble. Uh, well, it's too, too late to remediate. I did some cleaning up of, of this, but I didn't clean up, uh, clean up enough. Um, uh, oh, great. Okay. Well, uh, <laughs> okay. This is horrible. Uh, ignore every, ignore, uh, just pay attention to this. Okay. Just uh, ignore, uh, I'm going to put a big box over it. Um, here we go. Uh, let's, 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 let's um, out, out black spot. Um, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to try to cover it up. Um, okay. Um, well, that's, that's better. Um, and then all we have to do is rotate it and uh, we can get most, most of them uh, covered up. Okay, <laughs> there we go. Um, so pay no attention to the, um, uh, to the uh, covering, but um, here, here's our category with A, B, C, D, right? And um, the product category is gonna have every object from A, from C crossed with every other object from C. So we're gonna have an A cross A, we're gonna have a B cross B and all the associated with diagonal pairs, but we're also gonna have like an A cross C, right? And that's this guy here. Um, and we're gonna have an A cross B uh, and that's uh, mumble. Um, uh, A cross B has gotta be somewhere here, but um, uh, there it is, uh, way out here. That's that gal. So uh, here we have um, uh, this category crossed with itself. Now, what's more interesting than the objects again are the morphisms. And this criteria, okay, now, now my covering is coming off, um, are the morphisms. These are the morphisms here, right? And um, uh, and remember, there's a morphism in C cross C if and only if between pairs, uh, C and D and another pair, C prime comma D prime, uh, if and only, or equivalently C cross D, we, we write it the same way in, in category theory, cross is kind of a pairing. Um, so there's a morphism between them, if and only if there's a morphism from C to C prime and C and, and D to D prime and D. Now here D is C, so uh, if only if there's uh, uh, morphisms between the first the first component of this one to the first component of that one, the second component of that one to the second component. Okay, so so let's consider some of these. Let's consider, for example, a morphism from A to A to B to B. Surely there's a morphism there because there's a morphism from A to B, and we have A in the first component and B in the second, the first here, and and in the second and the second here. So. So there's a morphism between those. Um, and uh, similarly, you know, from C cross C to B cross B as well. Um, there's morph morph morphisms here as well. Um, so this morphism emerges from the fact that there's a morphism from C to B uh, here uh, within category C. Um, now, these are the less interesting ones. These are just kind of mirrors of this for this particularly sort of trivial case. Now, however, there's additional morphisms that, that are not a single morphism here, but are reflected as one here. So for example, um, A and C each have morphisms to B. So if we have A cross C, there's got to be a morphism from A cross C to B cross B because A has one to B and C has one to B. Um, and indeed, that's what this arrow is, right? Um, 
So these two have morphisms onto B and therefore the pairing of A and C is gonna have morphism onto B cross B, uh, B comma B. But more interesting yet is something like A cross C. So the pairing of A and C is gonna have a morphism to the pairing of anything that A goes to with the pairing of anything that, that uh, C, C goes to. So, so for example, BD. Um, and so we have morphism from AC to BD. This single arrow is reflective of this morphism at the same time as this one. Uh, it's just a pair. We could think of this arrow as a shorthand for a pair of arrows. Uh, be kind of nicer if you could draw it as a double arrow. Right. Um, so um, this is the product category. And there's no other arrows here um, between the pairs unless there's you know, pairs of arrows over here. So arrow, so so objects in the product category are pairs of objects, and arrows can be thought of as pairs of arrows. Okay. Um, so Fair enough, this is product categories and they're very common. Um, and they provide us the basis for talking about bifunctors, okay? This is a bit of a busy slide, but the, a bifunctor in general is a functor from a product category to another category. Uh, commonly that other category is not a product category, although it could be. Um, what makes it a bifunctor is that it takes these pairs um, and it knows what to do with the pairs. Okay, um, so it maps a pair of objects in C cross D into a single object in the destination category. Okay, so it will like map C cross B into a single object over here. Um, now I happen to have labeled this C tensor B uh, because this functor is named tensor. And so its action is to map that over and uh, I've written it in an infix sort of way. Uh, rather than writing tensor of C comma B, I write it as C tensor B. But this is just some old object in C. It's not created by the functor or something. It's just, it's just we're, we're labeling some object over here in C, C cross C tensor B. That's, it's just some object that was in C that we say that will be C tensor B, okay? Uh, that will be the target of this functor when applied to C cross B. C cross B is just a pair. And uh, this is, you know, the functor acting on that, the results of the functor acting on the pair. It's some object in C. It has to go to some object. A functor has to go to some object. But what's more interesting is what it does to arrows, right? I mean, um, category theory is all about morphisms, about taking morphisms seriously. And the, the functors, uh, what they do on objects is interesting. What they do on arrows is constrained by what they do on objects, but it's often much more interesting. Uh, and here, the functor is going to map uh, as well, morphisms over. And in my uh, late night uh, work on this, I, I didn't uh, properly label sort of uh, how these are drawn over, but you can imagine like if C cross C goes to this one and D cross D goes to this one, it has to be that H cross H, this arrow, this morphism between C cross C and D cross D has to map over to this one. It has to go between, you know, where the source of it goes and where the target of it goes. Apologies for the English. So, so this functor, this bifunctor, maps over these morphisms and it maps them into a single morphism in the target category. Okay. Uh, so here we have um, uh, here we have this this functor. And the functor is a, I mean, it's, it's just a functor operating on objects and morphisms like normal. It just so happens our objects are these pairs and the morphisms are pairs of morphisms. Um, 
now it's it's kind of it carries that functoriality of any functor um, in terms of mapping these morphisms and composability. Remember, our morphism has to be mapped to some morphism over here. Can't delete it. There can be collapsing going on in mapping uh, objects. Some of several of these objects might be mapped down to the same object, uh, and morphisms uh, therefore will go perhaps uh, from from two things that are originally distinct to those that are collapsed out and will go from that object to itself. But um, uh, they've got to be mapped over and it's got to preserve composition and it's got to preserve identity morphisms. So, um, you know, any two things that compose here have to be mapped to something that composes there. It's a functor and it's a law abiding functor. Um, okay, and, and our interest here is in these bifunctors from C cross C into C. Okay. Now, this is an aside, but for those of you who are a little bit further along your, your journey, uh, I think it's really cool. And we're going to come back to this. So it turns out bifunctors, you may shrug your shoulders at this and say, well, yeah, okay, so fine. There's this functor that operates on pairs and, and we have this construct of a product category. Oh, no. Um, uh, but but what's more interesting here, I should be presenting, what's more interesting here is, is their cousins, the profunctors. And knowing about bifunctors kind of provides a pathway to go into profunctors. And profunctors are, are really cool. Um, they're, they're much more interesting and personality filled than bifunctors. Bifunctors are, are kind of prosaic things. Profunctors, capture some really interesting stuff. And as Bartosz says, you consider them profunctors between C and D, categories C and D, as a proof relevant relation between C and D. It kind of relates an object in C to an object in D in a way that demonstrates how you can get from C to D or how expensive it is to get from C to D or whether you can get from C to D, et cetera. Um, but the functoriality is cool as well, because um, when you map morphisms, uh, a bifunctor will map a pair of morphisms, and so will a profunctor. But in a profunctor, a profunctor is like a bifunctor, except it's going from C op cross D to another category. Instead of going from C cross D to, to, to category, call it V. Um, we're going from C op cross D to V. And this op makes all the difference. Uh, it's, and you may think that's funky and weird, but no, it actually preserves the semantics of path, of path construction. So um, you end up being able to reason about um, uh, you, when it maps functions or morphisms you end up being able to reason about sort of uh, paths uh, that, that end up going from pre-composition of the first function uh, to it and then post-composition of the later function. And the, the direction of the arrows is all correct to reason about a path end to end as a result. Um, we'll be going into this, but profunctors are particularly neat in the sense that in a way bifunctors aren't that you can view a profunctor from C op cross D into another category as, as a functor. This is kind of weird. It's kind of a, it's kind of a functor from C to D or a, or a mapping from C to D. It's like a relation between C and D. And so we actually have a special arrow for it where C goes to D. And that's weird. Uh, it looks weird. Um, but it turns out to be really useful to think of this as kind of a, a mapping from C to D, even though it, it's a functor from C up cross D into something else, we think of it as a, as a kind of relation between C and D and write it as an arrow with this little line over it. This isn't quite the symbol, I, I should have latexed it, but um, um, I'll, I'll get around to that. In any case, um, We'll come back to profunctors. Profunctors, um, we'll, we'll be meeting them more and 
they'll be more interested in bifunctor. So here's a you know bifunctor going from this product category over, and um, again it can collapse things, etc. But it's a law-abiding functor. Okay, so all that is some equipment. Okay, all that is some machinery um, to allow us to better understand um, this next little bit, which is monoidal categories. Okay, so um, basically to understand this cryptic utterance uh, that a monad is nothing more than a monoid in the category of endofunctors, we need to explicate what it means to be for a category to have monoids or for it to have a monoidal structure, um, to be equipped with a monoidal structure. And you know the way that uh, David Spivak and Brendan Fong talk about it, um, I kind of like it. Um, you know, we, we talk about a category being equipped with monoidal structure if it has if it observes a set of properties. Um, uh, and a, uh, a category that does observe these properties that is equipped with this monoidal structure is termed a monoidal category. Uh, it's not its very essence that it's an you know, old category. It's, it's, it's equipped with a structure. It has, it has the structure. What is the structure? Well, it has a bifunctor, one of these guys that goes from C to cross C to C. This is a product category. So it's going from this sort of thing, pairs of objects from C back, back to C itself. You know, you should be starting to think, oh, that's it's kind of like a binary operation. It takes in two elements of C and it re returns an element of C, right? It, these are objects, but it it does do that. Um, so it's it's like a binary uh, operation, and we um, we have different bifunctors for different um, monoidal categories. For example, when we're dealing with um, set. Uh, often a very popular monoid with uh, category of sets and functions um, uh, might include, uh, for example, the the um, uh, a, a monoid where we when we uh, when we compose uh, with monoidal product we have tensor being uh, a pairing uh, of of things um, pairing up and so we put them in a tuple. Um, and a tuple can have uh, many elements in it. We, we string them up in a tuple. And the identity here is a singleton set because if we put it in a tuple with anything else, if we have a set one, two, three, and we put it in a tuple with a thing of just a single element, um, we, we haven't really added any information to it. Um, so, well, okay, I won't, I won't go into that further right now, but um, we'll come back to this quite a bit uh, with Levere theories, this watch should be quite important. Um, so it is a monoidal product. It's a binary operation of sorts, um, or it, it's, a, it's a bifunctor. You could think of it intuitively as kind of being binary operation-like but it takes any two objects and, and gives an object. So given any two objects in C, like A and C, it will pick out an object that is A cross C, that, that is monoidal product of A and C. So given any two objects here, it will pick out A tensor C. We call this thing tensor. Don't bother go look you up tensor algebra. It's a different sort of tensor. So this is a, we just call it the tensor symbol, tensor product. And a, a tensor C is this object. It's just some object. It's some, this is up. It could be A itself, right? Um, it's just a label for some object here because we got it with this functor from the product category to here. And it could have mapped A cross C into A. Sure, sure, that's fine. Um, but the point is a, a tensor C is some object in C, right? Uh, uh, a tensor D is some object in C. Um, 
So every pair of objects has some object that's its tensor product of that pair. Okay. But beyond that, it has a monoidal unit. Um, okay, now this, this is something which will get you to go back to some of the first lectures of this um, that I asked you to review. David Spivak's opening lectures of the MIT category theory uh, course in, in 2019. Um, and you may remember that if we have a mapping from a singleton thing to, to any other set, it's just like picking an element of that set. After all, how many functions are there? Well, there's one function, it's, it's going from a singleton thing. So it has no, it's, it's, it, it's definitely going from the only thing, <laughs> there's only one, one value for this function that it has to determine. And that's what thing that single object in the source maps to. Um, and that's exactly, that, that intuition is useful here because here we have a functor, which is a mapping from the single object category one into C. Okay, so its job in life is to pick an object of C. Uh, it, it picks one object of C. That is the object associated with this function. Those are all the possible values of the functor, one for each possible object of C. So it has some functor, so it's gotta be one of those. It's all, all it is is basically picking an object of C. So Sometimes I is just called an object of C. Okay, um, and here it's a singleton set. Okay, so this is just some object of C. So, so one of these objects is the is the monoidal unit, but this monoidal unit, we pick it. It has to to qualify. It has to observe some properties together with the monoidal product. They have to play together nicely. And particularly the monoidal unit, the particular object in C that's chosen to be the monoidal unit has to be such that when you combine it with any other all object with the monoidal product, when you hit it with the monoidal product, you combine any other object with this, this monoidal unit, you get back that other object in either order. Okay, so the monoidal unit um, serves as unit, serves as the, the kind of uh, distinguished uh, unit element, uh, the distinguished uh, specific, uh, uh, specific identity with respect to monoidal product. And, uh, that's captured in this, these rules of unitality. Uh, and further, there's an associativity rule that we have to have monoidal product be associative. So if we have C1 cross C2 cross C3, it doesn't matter where we put the parentheses, it comes out the same. There's a lot of things which are associative, as you know, um, string concatenation, for example, is associative. Uh, but then there's some things which aren't associative, and there's quite a few of those um, that we have to deal with, um, including pairing um, in in set. Um, so, reflective of the fact that um, that there's a lot of things which are almost associative, but not quite, like tupling of things. If we have C1 tensor, C2 tensor, three, C3, and we tuple it this way. We kind of group, if this is tupling, if it's, if it's putting them in a list and we, we tuple C2 and C3 and then put that in a list with a C1, we get something that's structurally different than C2 and C3 being tupled and then put in an outer tuple with C, C1 and C2 being tupled and then being paired up uh, and then being put in an outer parentheses with C3. Those are different technically, but they contain the same information. 
we can losslessly map from one to the other. We can take one and turn it into the other with no loss of information. They contain exactly identical information. They're isomorphic. Uh, and for all intents and purposes, they're kind of just about the same. They're equivalent. Um, so because of because there's a very frequent need to deal with this kind of um, the, this sort of awkwardness of equivalence, uh, there's different types of monoidal categories that that um, have different levels of strictness. So a strict monoidal category would require this to be exactly equal. Um, it's it's precise. It's got to be the same identically. Uh, that's a strict monoidal category. A strong monoidal, uh, monoidal category allows isomorphisms, particularly natural isomorphisms between these two. Um, and there's something we'll be seeing more of next time, a lax monoidal category, which is critical for applicatives, where we have natural transformations between these two. Okay. Um, and natural transformations here. That's a um, uh, even looser form of monoidal category. Now, these monoidal categories, um, uh, it turns out like the strict versus strong versus lax. Uh, David Spivak mentions in, in that video I've asked you to watch, you know, that um, that basically strong monoidal categories or, or strict monoidal categories are equivalent to um, uh, for small sets, I think, um, to, uh, uh, to, to what you get through, uh, uh, through lax monoidal categories um, or, or through strong monoidal categories. So there's some, like for smaller categories, there's some, um, ability to define one in terms of the other, et cetera. And uh, I, I'm not an expert in that. I don't remember the, uh, the exact nature of it, but basically you can define, uh, you, you can define one uh, interchangeably with the other with uh, enough extra uh, bits of work. Um, so monoidal categories will Th this structure turns out to be really important. It may seem like it's kind of an arbitrary thing, but it turns out to be really, really useful at different levels. One place will be useful for programming is for uh, applicatives and um, capturing their properties and specifically monoidal categories and lax monoidal categories in particular allow us to define monoidal functors, okay? and and those end up um, uh, in their lax form, lax monoidal functors being equivalent to applicatives. So that's one reason this is very important at a practical level. Another reason is that um, as Xiao Yan is very familiar with in detail, um, monoidal categories uh, are extremely useful in modeling um, and it turns out that you can have, and David Spivak alludes to this, that when you have a monoidal category, you can, um, uh, you can think of it as in terms of these wiring diagrams and um, think about things involving parallel composition, such as with tensoring two things or serial composition with composing things uh, in ways that um, are very visual. And it turns out that by so doing, um, we can capture a lot of structure that's useful in a modeling context. Um, and it's, um, it's, it can also be the basis for languages which describe models using category theoretic concepts like in CatLab. Um, uh, as supported by CatLab and Julia, and as supported by semantic models, um, uh, this this framework with which uh, Yana has been working. So here, monoidal categories um, 
end up having this outsized importance uh, that makes them crop up in all sorts of places at a practical level in the modeling context and quite a lot in the, in the functional programming context. So monoidal uh, categories have a set of laws associated with them that basically express in, in terms of commuting diagrams, the associativity law and the unitality law. And I want to talk about these a little bit because they give rise to the monad laws. Um, they can be seen as basically monad laws can be seen as, as ex examples of these. Um, so the monoidal coherence laws here basically involve um, having uh, successive monoidal products of things uh, for associativity, you can either apply, if you have three things um, uh, in a row, you can either apply uh, the monoidal product to collapse the right two and get down to C cross C. So monoidal product goes from C cross C to C, right? And C cross C to C. So you can collapse down these two and get to this, or you can collapse down these two and get to this. Um, and, and this is the identity, uh, the identity natural transformation here. Um, this is, uh, excuse me, the identity functor. Okay, I'll mumble. Yeah, it's the identity functor um, here. And you're, you're mapping down, uh, and then you apply this uh, monodal product again to go from C cross C to C. And it turns out that either way you do this, whoa, sorry. Either way you do this, whether through the upper and then down or, or down and then over, it has to give the same result. So it has to commute. Um, the triangle laws for, uh, for monoids uh, implement unitality. Those implement these components. And um, here we are taking this functor and uh, basically using it to grow. Um, so over here, uh, this, this C could be thought of as in a product category with one, with this, with this um, uh, uh, cate category one. Um, it's a single object category. Uh, and that can grow this C here going this way. And this ID of C just maps this C into a, a C. Alternatively, we could do the same thing in the other order. Uh, this is C cross one, technically, which is basically isomorphic to C. Um, and, and we can grow on the right-hand side of C and preserve this C. And if we do that, either way, and we map down with tensor, with this guy here, we should get back the same thing we started with, is what this is saying. Um, and that's exactly what's going on here. So if you take uh, any, any product with C of I, this, this I here, uh, we will end up getting the same thing back. So this unitality is showing two commuting diagrams here, um, this basic rule. Okay, uh, I cross C is the same as C. Um, this uh, this um, phrasing of it may be more uh, intuitive. Uh, it does it does capture kind of the similarity to to monoids of greater familiarity, like with natural numbers, etc. Um, okay, so um, so this is a monoidal structure. And any category that has is equipped with this monoidal structure, we can call a monoidal category. Um, and we further define a monoid in a monoidal category um, in this sort of way. So, so we can have a monoidal category and it's, it's got this ability to have monoids in it. That's really what this gives us. It's got the ability to have a monoid. 
Um, it has a unit element here that plays nicely with the monoidal product. It has this way of combining binary operations on objects. It's just waiting to have a monoid defined in it. Okay, so suppose we have a monoidal category and it's category C and it has this monoidal unit funk, this monoidal unit object, and it has this tensor product. So any two objects can be combined to get, to identify in another object that's their, that's their tensor product. Um, okay, well, what's a monoid in this? Well, look, um, it's an object M within C, in this C. Um, if for this particular M, we have two morphisms, this is kind of being a self-contained monoid in this category. It's got to have a, it, it's got to have the ability to map any two objects of M or to map M cross M. I shouldn't say any two objects of M. M is an object. It maps, there's got to be a morphism that's M cross M. That's some object in this category, C, um, M cross M, right? That's that's what cross gave us. It gives us an object in C. So it's some object in C. There's got to be a morphism between that object and M. Okay. Um, and, and, you know, kind of you could think, okay, any two elements of M can be combined to generate an M. They can, can be combined with this binary operation. Yeah. Um, but M cross M, M tensor M is just, it's an object in C. It may not be M itself, it could be another object, but um, uh, it's, it's got to have a morphism to M. Um, and, and then secondly, we, we have this operation from I, is morphism from I to M. Now this, this may seem you kind of weird. I mean, wait a minute, this I is, so I was a monoidal unit. It was an object in C that played nicely with unitality. What are we doing here with it? We're somehow we have a morphism between I and M. Um, and yeah, it's a little bit like having a morphism between one and you know the a, a singleton set with one in it and another set. It, picks an element of that set. Um, so it's kind of like picking an element of one. Um, it's a particular morphism going from I to, to M. It's basically selecting uh, a, a member of, of, of M, okay? Um, and this will turn out to be a monoid within C um, such that we are able to combine this E with other, so this is, this is a morphism and uh, it will serve as, as the unit and, and this is kind of multiplication for this monoid. Okay, so, so this is how a monoid is defined in a category with monoidal structure. It has these two morphisms and the morphisms are not from M to itself, the morphisms are from I to M and from M cross M to M. Um, but this is characterized as, as a monoid here. Now, to, in order to complete this definition, we're going to talk about the category of endofunctors uh, in order to complete this monoid, monoid half. Monad is a monoid in the category of endofunctors. So we have to define what the category of endofunctors are. Okay, so there's a category. And what are its objects? The objects are functors from C to C. So this is a category specific to C and it's called end of C. It's for a particular C, okay? Um, it can also be written C cross C in brackets, meaning it's, thing, it's functors from C to C. Um, but we could specify just say end of C because this is very specific functors, it's from C to C. Okay, um, objects are these endofunctors in C. They're functors from C to C. Okay, so 
here they might be like objects. If you think about Hask, this category might have things like lists, um, like the list uh, functor. It takes in a type. It's like a type. Think of it with a type constructor. It takes in a type and returns a list of that type, or maybe of of X uh, or trees of X uh, or the uh, uh, the um, uh, say uh, uh, functions from uh, two X uh, from some fixed type, for example. These these would be examples of functors. Um, morphisms here are mappings between these objects. These objects are functors. So the morphisms are mappings between functors and mappings between functors that preserve the structure of that functor are natural transformations. Um, they kind of relate one functor to another, right? They say where the mouth was for the person and it relates it to where the mouth is for the dog. Um, to use Bartosh's evocative example. So for two objects, F and G, these are functors, these are endofunctors um, going from C to C. Okay, so it's like list, uh, the list endofunctor and the maybe endofunctor. We have a, a natural transformation uh, between them. Um, and and that natural transformation uh, is an arrow in this category. It's a morphism. So it might be, you know, safe head goes from a list of an X to a maybe of X. Okay. So those are the morphisms. Um, the there's got to be an identity morphism that when you compose it with anything else, it gives the same thing. Well, it's just the identity morphism. For a given object, objects are functors from C to C. And what's the identity morphism? Well, it's just identity natural transformation. All it does is it maps, it maps each object to itself, uh, to to back to to itself. So it's it's not going anywhere. It's uh, just a as, as Bartosz says, it's a bunch of squigglies um, that just go from, uh, from the, uh, uh, the object C to itself, okay? Uh, so those are the components of this natural transformation. Each natural transformation related one functor that the next says, for each object, how does it map from functor F to functor G? Here, uh, we're mapping from F to F, and so it's just the identity of each of those is an identity morphism. The composition of two morphisms, this is important. If we have two morphisms, H going from F to G, uh, this is a natural transformation. So I've written it, it's a morphism. So it's a natural transformation from functor F to functor G. These are objects in endo functors of C end of C. This is a morphism, F to G. So H is a natural transformation. K is a natural transformation from G to H. Okay, so we have these objects which are endofunctors. We have these natural transformations between them. Um, and we've named two here, H and K, and they're lined up end to end. So H goes from F to G and K goes from G to H. Well, you may remember that something like this, um, we have here end-to-end -end mappings um, associated with, uh, with these. So, so morphisms uh, here are associated with, uh, with natural transformations. So this is a natural transformation from F to G. Okay, now, uh, okay, I should, should have renamed this for this diagram. So F to G and G to H, uh, these are given by, it turns out the horizontal 
composition of these natural transformations. Okay, so uh, this is an example of horizontal uh, composition associated with natural transformations. So we have alpha going from F to F prime here and beta from G to G prime. And we compose those. So these are two natural transformations that we compose them horizontally and we get um, H composed with G, uh, excuse me, uh, K composed with, uh, with H, K after H. This is horizontal composition. Um, and because horizontal composition is associative, the composition operator is also associative. So it turns out this satisfies category, the rules for being a lawful category. Um, we have objects, we have morphisms, we have identity morphisms, we have composition of morphisms um, in a way that returns another morphisms in the category, and we have associativity associated with that. So this is a category. Now, okay, let's let's weave this all together to understand this cryptic statement. Um, okay, so we have category of endofunctors. Okay, objects are endofunctors. Morphisms are natural transformation. And then we have monoids. And monoids have this monoidal product. There's a monoidal unit associated with this, this uh, feature of, of the, the category. And, and in order to be a monoid in a category, we have to have these relations here, which it's kind of like saying we can combine any two elements to get a third element and we can, we have to pick an element that's our identity element. Okay. Um, but let's go through this for, for um, uh, the category of endofunctors of C. So I would say this category of endofunctors has a monoidal structure. We can, this category is equipped with a monoidal structure. What is that monoidal structure? Because if we can define it, we can define what a, mo uh, a monoid is within this. So this category of endofunctors, where objects are endofunctors and morphisms are natural transformations between them, has a monoidal structure. And the monoidal structure is as follows. So we need, for the monoidal structure, we need an I, right? We need a monoidal unit. We need this thing that if you, Combine it with anything else with this tensor, you get that other thing. Okay, what is our when I going to be? It's going to be, well, I has to be, we could define it as a mapping from, and I have to apologize here from, uh, for going back again here to show this. We could define as a mapping from one to the category of endofunctors of C, but you know, really that's picking an object in C. So we could just as well say as shorthand, I is just, it's some object in C. It's just an object in C. What object is it? Well, what are the objects of C here? It's a category of endofunctors. So the objects are endofunctors. Each object is an endofunctor. It's a functor from, from some base category to itself. Okay, so we have to pick one of those. What endofunctor are we going to pick such that it has nice properties? Well, we're going to pick the identity functor, identity endofunctor. It just maps a category, objects in a category to the same objects, morphisms to the same morphism. Okay, uh, okay, so. Yeah, the identity sounds like a good choice for the monoidal unit, um, monoidal identity. Yeah, that sounds plausible. But what's the monoidal composition? Because, um, or what's the monoidal product? Because we have to specify I back here. We have to specify I. But what are we going to specify for the monoidal product for this category of endofunctors? What's our monoidal product? What's our way of combining any two objects? in the category of endofunctors to get another object in the category of endofunctors. How are we gonna combine them? What's our, our way of combining them? It's gonna play nicely with choosing this 
identity endofunctor as our object i. Well, gosh, if we have an identity endofunctor as i, what sort of things when you do it with respect to an identity endofunctor, um, what, what sort of uh, ways of combining that with other endofunctors will, will preserve that other endofunctor? Well, as you might imagine, um, what we can do is we can compose it. So we compose this, I, if we compose the identity with any other endofunctor, we get that other endofunctor, okay? We compose an identity functor, maps from this thing to itself with any other functor. It's like we never did the original mapping. It's so, so here we have composition being our monoidal product. Oh man, okay. So, so we have, we're defining a monoidal structure. We need a monoidal structure to find what a monoid is. We're working in this category of endofunctors where each object is an endofunctor. Um, and to define the monoidal structure, we have to pick an identity, uh, an identity object. And we chose the identity as identity object, the identity endofunctor, that's an object. Uh, and we chose for the monoidal product, the tensor, to tensor one object with another, to combine any two objects to get another object out, we use composing them. And how is it possible? Well, because each of those objects is an endofunctor. And it, because it's an endofunctor, it goes from C to C. After all, if it went to some other category, we couldn't necessarily compose two arbitrary ones, right? Because it's it's going to another category, they have to line up then. But this these endofunctors, they all go from C to C. And this should start to sound familiar. This is very similar to when we talked about monoids as the self loops, uh, as associated with these self loops. Each loop goes from an object back to itself, if you remember that. And therefore any of them can be composed. Each of those you know, those loops back, those, those uh, morphisms back to itself could be composed with any other one. Um, and in fact, it was that composition that combined them to yield another element. That was how we capture monoids as objects. There were these single object categories. We had these morphisms from that object to itself. And we, because they went back to itself, we could combine any one with any other and collectively they constituted the elements of the mono. It's the same darn thing here. We have this, we have these, this, these objects here, which are endomorphisms. They go from C to C. And so we can combine any, it's, and it's a whole category of endomorphisms of C. So we can combine any one with any other one by composing them and get back an endomorphism. Great. Great. Um, so we can compose two objects with tensor and get back another object by recognizing their endofunctors and we can compose endofunctors. So that's our rule for composition. Remember when we define a category, we pick the rule. Um, excuse me, excuse me, I, I misspeak. This is our rule for tensor product. Uh, we, we pick, we need to define our tensor product and we have chosen it so that C cross C, we know that C, hey, C here is endofunctor. So we can just have the rule for C cross C to give us a C, we just compose the two endofunctors. We get another endofunctor and that's our results of this monoidal product. Okay, great. Um, so we have our monoidal product and we have our identity. And this identity is an endofunct identity endofunctor. When you combine it with monoidal product with any other endofunctor, it gives that other endofunctor. Great. So that's our monoidal structure. Excellent, excellent. That's our monoidal structure. So you can pat yourselves on the back. That's our monoidal structure. Happy, happy. Um, 
And uh, because composition is associative, we, we get associativity. And this is true for composition with any other, with any, uh, with any identity endofunctor, you get these nice properties. So composing it with any other endofunctor gives that endofunctor back. Great, so this is our structure. But now we can define a monoid. Because now that we have a monoidal structure on endofunctor of C, the category of endofunctors, end of C, we can define a monoid within that. So let's go back and finish the job, right? Um, so what is a monoid within this category, end of C, that's equipped with this monoidal structure? We know we have the monoidal structure is tensor, as tensor associated with we have this monoidal, this monoidal uh, identity, uh, monoidal unit I. Okay, so what's the monoid here? Well, a monoid is a, remember this, a monoid is a specific, a, a, an object is a monoid within this category equipped with a monoidal structure. Um, this object M is a monoid if and only if there's two particular morphisms here um, associated with it. Okay, so it has to be an object in C. So if we pick an object in C, let's call it T. Okay, you know why, right? Uh, let's call it T. This is some object in C. It will be a monoid. T will be a monoid in this category of endofunctors if it meets this condition, right? It has to meet these two conditions. There has to be a, a morphism in endo, an end of C that maps from T tensor product T to T. Okay, but in this category end of C, what's tensor product? What is tensor product? What did we say it was? Anyone remember? What was it? Composition. composition. Yeah, it's composition of endofunctors. So this is this is like T composed with T. Uh, we have to be able to get out. Um, we have, if we compose T with T, we need a morphism from T composed with T to T, right? Because M is is T here. We're we're saying we have a candidate M, and it will be a Monoid in this category of endofunctors if it if it meets this criteria. Okay, so we have t, we need a morphism from T tensor product T, which is T composed with T in terms of the endofunctors, and we need a morphism from that to T. But what's a morphism in the category of endo in this category end of C? What's the morphisms? The morphisms are what? They are the objects are endofunctors, and what are mappings between functors? They are natural transformations. Natural transformations. So we're saying we need a natural transformation for T to be a uh, a monoid in this category, equipped with this monoidal structure, this end of C. In order for it to be a monoid qualifies a monoid. We need a mapping from T tensor T, that's T composed with T, to T. And that mapping is a natural transformation. So it, it's saying we need a natural transformation for go from T composed with T to T. And what is that? <laughs> do, do you recognize that natural transformation? It collapses a list of lists into a list, or a maybe of maybe into a maybe. It, this sounds like what? Join. Join, it's join, it's join, ladies and gentlemen. There's a, there's a more, there's a natural transformation. We called it mu. Remember that? Um, it, it, it goes from, T composed with T to T. So it goes from like lists of lists of X to, to list of X, or maybe of maybe of X to maybe of X. 
um, we we could take a probability distribution and probability distributions and go down to a probability distribution. We could take a power set of power sets and turn it into through union a power set. Um, so so this is so so one thing that it needs to qualify as a monoid in the category of endofunctors for, for T to be a monoid, it has to have this natural transformation that will go from T composed with T down to T. Okay, that's one thing it needs, but it needs something else. It needs something else. There's another criteria, oh, man, man. It needs something else. It needs this. There needs to be a mapping from the unit element of, of this monoidal category into T, because M is T here. We're, we have this canna called T that we want to know, is it a monoid? Well, it'll be a monoid if there's a natural transformation from T composed with T down to T. Okay, but we also need a mapping from I. Anyone remember what I is in the category of endofunctors? What do we choose to be our, our I? What do we choose, whoa, to be the apple of our eye? We chose what? The identity, the identity endofunctor. This is a category end of C where each object is, is a endofunctor. And so we had to choose an I for a monoidal structure, which is an object of C. And we chose the identity, the identity endofunctor. That's one object in this category of endofunctors of C. There's one object that's the identity object, the identity endofunctor. We that's what we chose, right? We chose it. So, so that was for our monoidal structure on endo C. And now to be a monoid in this, we need a mapping from that object to, and for T to be a monoid in this category of endofunctors, we need a mapping from that object I, which is the identity endofunctor into T. We need a mapping from identity endofunctor in, <laughs> into T. And what does this sound like? Does that sound like anything? Where have we seen this before? A, a natural transformation that goes from identity functor into T. Let me write it out this way. If I write it on components, this is a natural transformation. So you can always write them in components. The job of a natural transformation is for any stinking object C, it says how to map from, from um, one functor applied to C to another functor applied to C. So I'm gonna write this I'm going to write this thing for a for a particular element C. Maybe this will help, right? Um, hey, come on. There's I'm I'm writing the component of. Okay, I'm giving my hand away. Ada of C, right? Um, this is just uh, identity uh, endofunctor on C mapped to T of C. But you know this is this is kind of wordy stuff. I could just rewrite this as, you know, this is just totally equivalent to, to this, right? Identity just maps C to C. So does this look familiar? What does that look like? Fine. Yeah. yeah I, this is, this is unit. This is return. This is pure. This is, this is taking any object and turning into a monad. Uh, so any type, so, so we take in an int and we turn it into a, um, into a, a maybe event. We take in a bool, we turn, we, we, so, so we have bools and uh, we turn it into a, a list of bool. Um, as a singleton. We have maybe of an int and we turn it into just int. This is 
return. This is unit. This is pure. This is the component of the of the the monoid. Um, sorry, this is this is one of the things that's needed for it to be a monoid. So what this is saying is, the the qualification rules to be a monoid uh, within the category of endofunctors say that you need two natural transformations. One going from so if if you have a monoid for for a for an object an endofunctor in the category of endofunctor, this one of these objects called T, for that to be a, a, a monoid in the category of endofunctors, it needs to have two natural transformations associated. One mapping T composed with T to T. That's one natural transformation. That's what we have been calling mu join takes a list of lists and turns it into a list. Takes a maybe if maybe and turns it into a maybe. It needs another natural transformation, which goes from the identity endofunctor to T uh, to T. Uh, that's a natural transformation. And if we think about it, components, it goes from some, some value C of a type to the functor for that type, like maybe of int, uh, an instance of that. So this is going from an instance of int to an instance of maybe of int. And what's that instance is just that value we gave it. This is going from, uh, going from a bool to a list of bool. It's going from a particular bool to a singleton element of a list of bool. So it's going from an instance of a bool to, a, to an instance of a list of bool. That's what this natural transformation is doing, okay? Um, and so in order to qualify as a monoid within the category of endofunctors, we need these two natural transformations. But not only do we need that, we need these laws to apply. So this is great, but we need, we need to have these monoid laws uh, associated with our monoidal category. And it turns out that if we consider those, that's exactly the rules for monads. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, these are the two natural transformations, eta and mu, return, pure, unit, whatever you want to call it, return pure unit on um, eta on the one hand and mu or join on the other or multiply. Those, if we, if we consider those, we, we basically get out these, these monad laws because here um, we are going to get mu serving as this thing that goes from T tensor T. Tensor here is composition. Remember we defined it as composition here. We have two endofunctors. What can we do with two endofunctors? We need some way of turning two endofunctors into a single endofunctor. What are we gonna do? We're gonna compose them. Great, that's, that's how for our monoidal structure, that's how we've defined what, what mono what uh, tensor product is it's just composition so mu its job in life is to map t composed with t to t um so this is mu is just tensor product identity endofunctor well we just write it as t it's it's just this is how we write identity on t um and it's a it's a sad tradition but um, that's how it's written. I've described that in the past. And, um, and so this, mo this monoid law, which is the law associated with monoids to enforce these conditions, that monoid, those monoid laws of associativity and unitality that say these diagrams have to compute, those turn into exactly the monad laws. Those are the monad laws. This tensor product turns into mu, because that's how we realize tensor product. It's a natural transformation from these guys to that. 
So this is our, our natural transformation. Um, and in this identity, we just write it as T and it's precisely the same thing. If these are, these monad laws are just the monoid laws, just, just for the appropriate rules for, for how we combine these, these uh, endofunctors and uh, the names we use for how to, how to perform this mapping uh, with tensor product. Okay, so I wanna, you know, again, emphasize this intuition. Um, what's going on here? Let's first talk about this associativity. Um, what's going on, because I, I don't think I really dealt with that adequately before. Um, it was a gap on my part or, or lapse on my part. Um, okay, so if we have a, a list of lists of lists, and that's a mouthful, you could probably think of a list of ints. You could think of a list of lists of ints. Yeah, so that's a, it's a, it's a list. And each element of that list is a list itself. But here we're actually starting with a list of those lists of lists. Oh man, um, yeah, so a list, each element of this list is a list of lists, okay? Yeah, um, now if we have that, we can either, we, we can get down to a stinking list by, by collapsing either the outer two layers first or the inner two layers first, right? We gotta collapse layers of this. Um, and here on the left, uh, the left side, we're going to collapse the outer two. So we're going to take that, we have this list of, list of lists, and we're going to take those, that, that outer, outer layer, um, which, okay, so we have a list and we're going to turn that into just one layer. So we're gonna smush it down uh, and, and have a, a list of, of, of lists that emerge, that emerges. Instead of a list of lists of lists, we're gonna have a list of lists, okay. Um, or we can mush down the, the sort of the inner two layers with it and do it from the bottom up as it were um, and concatenate that very first layer of lists at the bottom, um, we could concatenate all of them, put them all together instead of having them separate out into these different boxes. We put them all together. And that's what this one is. Um, we're kind of collapsing down inside here. Here we're collapsing outside first. And either way we get to a list of lists. But then if we collapse that down, we just get a list. And this has to give the same thing either way. And that's what this monoid law basically is saying. Look, we can, yeah, if you have this monoid, the parentheses don't matter. You could combine these two first and then that one, or you know, the, the, the later ones first and then that it, you know, think of this as like concatenating strings or concatenating lists, for example. Uh, doesn't matter where the parentheses are. Um, uh, you can you can divide them up and you'll get the same result for, for a monoid. And that's what the monad laws insist, that you have to be able to do this and get this nice well-defined behavior that either way goes the same thing. Now over here, we talked about it <clears throat> before, but um, you know it's worth emphasizing. I had some examples on a past slide, but this slide is a bit crowded uh, for that. But basically <clears throat> here, um, we are, oh, so I, I talked through this earlier, um, but basically Ada here is being applied. Now this, this is kind of interesting um, about where this, uh, this comes from. So Ada combined with, uh, with uh, composed with, with T, um, 
is, and uh, I thought I had a nice diagram to illustrate this. Um, come on. Um, oh man. Um, yeah, it's actually this one. Um, okay, so basically, if you have eta composed with t, eta after t, this is like having a t first and then having eta after it. So this is like an identity, identity uh, natural transformation followed by eta. And it turns out that uh, that basically this is like shifting this natural transformation eta to operate on uh, values as mapped by F here. So that is, um, is basically eta operating on whatever T of C is. So T of C might be the list one, two, three, and we have eta that takes one, two, three as a whole and it sticks it into a list of lists. So it, stick, it makes a list of the list one, two, three. Oh boy, okay. Um, so that's, that's what that does. So this thing is lifted, uh, sorry, is, is shifted to kind of operate on the list of one, two, three. And it just injects that into a list, boom. And it creates a singleton list of the list one, two, three. This way though, does it kind of the, a, a different way. So here we have eta, sorry, we have T um, after eta. And it turns out that, that the way that works, if you review the material from last time, here we have eta first and then T. T is this identity natural transformation. Uh, eta is, is going first. And what you get here is a lifting, a lifting of eta um, with T. So it, it kind of um, applies eta to each element of the T. It, it, it puts eta, sort of gets eta underneath the T and applies it to each element. So here, if we had a, a list um, one, two, three, um, we, would, we would apply eta to the first element of it, one, and get a, a, a list of that. And then we'd apply eta to the second element and get a list of two a singleton list of two. When we apply to eta to the third element, get a list of three. And so then we have a, a list of, of lists. And so the list we, we composed here was the list of, of the list one, two, three. This one is the list of the list of one, comma, the list of two by itself, comma, the, the, the list of three. So it's three singleton lists within this outer list. Okay, so we got two different ways here. Okay, but they have to map the same way. When we collapse them in the next stage, we collapse them down. It, 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 it smushes them all down and we end up getting a list of one, two, three. And that has to be the same as the original list we started with. And that's what, monad laws require. And that's exactly the same as the monoid laws. This is the monoid just saying, look, C times C times the unit gives C or unit times C gives C. Uh, it's, it's just the same, same thing um, given that these are natural transformations. So the monad laws are the monoid laws because monads are monoids, they are precisely the same as what the monoids are in this category of endofunctors. They are endofunctors that have are equipped with natural transformations from T composed with T down to T because morphisms in the category of endofunctors are natural transformations and because the category of endofunctors is equipped with a monoidal structure where a monoidal product is composition. Um, so it's equipped with this morphism, this natural transformation, and it's equipped with this natural transformation 
which is just a natural transformation from the identity endofunctor to T, which is precisely eta. This is join, this is eta, and it observes the monoid laws by virtue of, well, it observes the monoid laws by virtue of the monol, associated with its monoid structure, and uh, a monad, therefore, is nothing more or less than a monoid in the category of endofunctors. Um, it simply, they are the monoids in the category of endofunctors associated with the given base category C. Um, okay, so this is another view of monads. We, we start with monads coming out of adjunctions and these, and we add eta coming out of that by these round trip paths. And we had mu coming out of that uh, as well, um, associated with uh, recognizing the ability to apply these transformations. Uh, we had mu that, that kind of could be defined in terms of, um, of epsilon R and L, or identity transformations and R identity transformations and L. This is another way they come up. The, the monad laws came out of adjunction triangle equalities and so on and, and naturality, but they also come out of the monoid laws. These, these things kind of support each other and these, they're these deep structures that link all these things that mean this has to be the case. It must be the case that that all these things uh, interweave. But it's one of the reasons why, uh, as, as uh, David Spivak said, echoing another category theorist who may have been John Bies, um, these things are uh, sort of, there's this uh, sort of very, very sort of, uh, uh, amorphous way these things, it's not quite amorphous, it's, it's just uh, there's this primordial ooze that one thing can be defined in terms of another, but they all are consistent. That's the beauty of it. They're all consistent. Uh, you can rederive it any other numbers of ways. And for those struggling with category theory here, I want to remind you that um, this is an asset, not a liability. The ability to rederive the monad laws um, through multiple lines means that if you forget one aspect, you can rederive it. It has to be that way. It simply must be that way to make sense. And so it provides a certain comfort or a certain um, uplift, perhaps, to recognize that um, even if you forget part of it, um, you can fill that all in from what you still remember. You can fill in that missing piece because it just, it ends up being applied by, by the rest. Um, so monads uh, have this um, you know, prominent place uh, associated with them. Uh, we'll see that they're also linked in with Levier theories and um, they emerge from Levier theories as well. Um, and or, or if we can relate them to Levere theory. So there's many different ways you can get from one place to the other and many different ways you could remember these things that you've forgotten, such as the monad laws, you could sort of rederive what they have to be from any number of different paths. So I talked you know, in, in previous session uh, about interchangeable ways of specifying monads. And I gave basically uh, three of them. One is a category theoretic way um, with join and return. Uh, the next would be all these have return as a, as a uh, key element, but closely composition. And the other is uh, with bind or, or sometimes called flat map. Um, now uh, let's take a look at, at ADA for different monads. Um, so, Eta for different monads. Remember what eta is. Eta is this way of going from a from like a bool to a, an instance of bool to an instance of list of bool, or an instance of int to an instance of maybe event. Right. Um, let's go go think about this. So for list, here we take an instance of int. Let's say we turn it into a singleton list. This is not an accident. 
this is not an accident. It has to be this way uh, for it to satisfy all the rules of monads. Um, uh, it's a singleton list. Uh, for maybe we have, we take a bool and we turn it into a just a bool. Um, for the writer monad, uh, where we have possible output associated with this, um, uh, we take say an int and we we return something that's that int, but with a an empty log, an empty string, or something that hasn't yet output anything. Um, uh, and and that's um, uh, that's you know a uh, a nice element. Now in general. The way this is defined in Haskell, this can be, the first one doesn't have to be string. I've shown it as string just to be clear, but it, it needs to be a monoidal value. And you should start to understand why. It needs a monoidal unit. And this would be the monoidal unit here. Um, so maybe it's not a string. Maybe it accumulates a list or maybe it accumulates uh, an integer that counts the number of times something has been invoked or something like that, something has been called. This could be any monoid. And, and so there's a way of combining it with a monoidal operation for each time we, we, we perform this. It might be plus for a count, or it might be append for a string, or, uh, or append for a list, or concatenate for a string, or any number of, of different things. Um, and then there's a, an element A. This is the monoidal unit for whatever monoids in the first position. And mono unit for string is empty string. Why? Because if we combine it with monoidal product, which is concatenate of strings with any other string, we get that other string back. This is the monoidal unit for string. Uh, power set, ladies and gentlemen, power set. Um, what's the monoidal unit for this? Well, it's the Singleton set. Um, uh, so if we have an int, we uh, create a singleton uh, of, of int. Um, and that's, uh, that's going to end up uh, uh, allowing us to operate in terms of, of uh, functions um, that did operate on ints. It will kind of provide a way to apply all those functions, the singletons, it guarantees it agrees with functions, um, um, you know, with the traditional definition of a function. Uh, so, so with power set, um, we're going to be able to uh, have a join operation uh, associated with it, which will be union and we'll, we'll come to, um, but this is the, uh, the monoid, this is the uh, the eta associated with it. Um, remember this uh, eta um, is going to be defined in terms of, um, it's it's going to have a Kleisley when we combine it with any other uh, Kleisley arrow mapping from say ints to, uh, to some other uh, uh, set of, of ints. If we combine this uh, with it by mapping this over any other set, we'll get something which is isomorphic to that set and we combine it with join and we'll get that original set. We, we could take a set, we could map this thing that takes each element of that set and turns it into a singleton set. So we go, we have A comma B comma C, we map it with this function eta. It gives a, uh, a set now of, it's a set of sets. So it's a set of the set of A, the set of B, the set of C, just as singletons. And then we combine it with join and we'll get back the original set. Probability distributions, we just get back a distribution where A occurs with probability one. It's a Dirac delta function for those familiar with it. Um, an impulse function, that's sometimes called. Either, well, either will, um, uh, will, take in a, a kind of a left value if things are bad or a right value if things are, are off base. We'll just um, take any old value and turn it into right. It'll just be success, okay? In a reader monad, um, we will take uh, reader monad, it will take uh, environment and 
it'll just return what we originally gave it. It will take the environment, but it will, it will um, return this original value. Um, conceptually, this, this is like taking an A and, and an E and then giving A, but we've broken it up to, to fit into the monoid, mon, monad context as a, as a function of a functor applied to A, which is just things of value E to A. Um, e mapping to A. State monad, it'll just be something that similarly here takes in a state and returns the pair of that particular state, no changes to it, and A. Okay. Um, it just leaves the state unchanged. It just returns the, the value. Um, this is return for different monads, this transformation, this natural transformation that went from C instances of of this type C, like a, a bool to a list of bool or to a, a, a set of bool or what have you. That's exactly what's being listed here. Let's look at join. Okay, this is kind of our grand tour. Um, let's take a look at join. Okay, um, so join for a list, if we go through these, um, gosh, did state not, maybe it's off the end here or something. Um, Anyway, if we have a list of lists, um, we have to combine into a list. Well, what do we do? Well, we flatten them, right? We have a list of the singletons, a, a singleton with A, singleton list with B, singleton list with C, and we just turn it into a, a list of A, B, C. Or we have a list of list, the list, a, a singleton list on the outer level of of ABC um, all in one list. So we have a singleton, we have a, the outer, we have a list of the sing, the, of which consists of one element, which is the list ABC, and we combine those into ABC as well. Ah, it, it, it works either way with which way you come along this, it, it should work. Okay, so mu for writer monad, well, here we're, for the case of string, we concatenate the strings. But if in general, as in Haskell, we have a monoid in the first element instead of very the specific monoid of, of string, we just apply the monoidal operation to combine the strings. We combine them with the monoidal operation. Uh, if it's string, it's concat. If it's, um, if it's um, a number, maybe, we want to apply the monoidal operation. We're using it maybe with the monoid plus. So we combine those things with plus. So maybe in some times we times them together or what have you. Power set, we just take the union of all these subsets. Um, so here we have a, a set of sets and we turn it into a set. And I alluded to this case earlier. Um, and regardless of whether it's the set the set of the singleton sets, singleton with A, singleton of B, singleton of C. For that, we get, if, if we have that set of those singleton sets, we get out the set of ABC. Alternatively, if we have the set of the set ABC, and that's the only one in this outer set, we also get ABC back, all right? Um, Probability distributions, well, here we, we take the weighted average of the inner distribution. Uh, we, have, we have some distribution over distributions that says for each of those inner distributions, what's the probability of it occurring? And look, we take the weighted average of the inner distributions where the weight is given by the outer distributions. And we sort of, you know, combine them together in that way, in the way that Paolo talked about in that probability monad. Uh, or probability monads. And there's all swack of probability monads. They're really cool. Um, either, okay, either, well, we're gonna have an either and either. And look, if either one is left, um, um, we will signal with left. Um, otherwise, uh, if, if we have a, um, if we have right of, of right, we'll just use the, um, the appropriate um, uh, inner inner value associated with with that. Um, so if we have a, a 
a right of right of of a value a, we'll just use that that you know right of a as as that value. Um, okay, and uh, uh, when we have a state monad, uh, we have this outer and 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 inner uh, associated with it, and we're essentially stringing them together in a way that allows the state return from the first thing to be used as the input for the state return to the second thing. Uh, and, and we end up uh, uh, combining them by sequencing them, essentially, uh, sequencing them then through. Um, and if like the inner state uh, is just the pass-through state like this, uh, it didn't modify anything, uh, then, you know, we could just collapse it down to one level of state. If the outer state is just a pass through and we all we have is one state or think of it as statement internally that modifies things and the other one doesn't, we can just use that one statement. So um, uh, state collapsed with a unit for state will, will just collapse to a single one. Okay, here's closely composition. Now you may remember closely composition for a closely composition here. Oh gosh, okay, it's, it's, it's that late. I don't know if my smartphone here today. Um, uh, okay, so um, mumble here. Um, with closely composition, you may remember that we have um, a closely category. So for a given category, C, um, this might be Hask, for example. Um, well, have the closely category associated with that. And each arrow here, like F, this arrow from A to B is not a function for, for the case of ask, it's not a function which takes say an int and returns a bool. It's a function that takes an int and returns a, a T of bool. So maybe it's a maybe of bool. Um, and uh, the identity arrows here, the identity morphisms, are things that take an A and return a T of A. Um, so it might take an int and return a, a list of int or maybe of int. This is all for one category T. So let's say maybe, let's just say maybe, okay. Uh, we're just dealing with maybe. Uh, it's a classic category for maybe. Um, and um, for this particular uh, base category. And the thing that distinguishes this as the identity morphism is if we compose it with anything else, we get that other thing back uh, in either order. Um, that's what makes it an identity morphism. And um, you know, this is um, uh, what what happens. And it turns out that you can define this combination um, f and of f and g with this fish operator. You could just define it as this. And, and we went through some of the reasoning last time and uh, the basic idea hopefully will have stuck in your head. I mean, basically look, um, uh, if F, if G maps from A to T of A, or sorry, to T of B, and F maps from uh, B to T of C, we can combine them to get something that maps from A to T of C by First applying G, that gives us a T of B. Okay, well, F takes F takes a B-like thing, but, but F needs a B and we have a T of B. So what can we do? We map F over the results of G and we get a T of T of B. Uh, sorry, a T of, T of T of C. And then we join the results and we get a T of C. And that gives us something that maps from A to T of C. So we've composed this. Um, and uh, you know, if, if we wanna think how that operates in these different ones, um, I've, I've kind of described it here. Okay, so for list, for example, um, we, we can take, um, uh, this, this looks, um, uh, yeah, so I, 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 I flipped that around. It should be F goes first and then G, sorry. Um, I, I reverse the order there, my description. So here, if we have uh, a list, for example, we might apply F to an A 
So F is going A to T of B and G is going B to T of uh, T of C. And we're gonna get out by composing them A to T of C to T of C. So how do we get that? Well, we look, we apply F to A first and we get out a, a T of B. Uh, and then we apply G to that and we get out a T of T of C um, because we're mapping, F mapping G, we're lifting G to apply to a T of B and, and it's gonna return for each element of T of B, it's gonna return of T of C. And so we get a T of T of C um, and then we flatten and boom, and we get back to a T of C. Great, for maybe, what do we do? Well, look, um, I mean, conceptually, if either f of g returns nothing, return nothing. Otherwise, we apply g to the result of f of a. Uh, so if f returns nothing here, um, then then we bomb out. We don't. It short circuits. We don't do g. Uh, so don't bother doing g. It, it, g consumes b's. We don't have a b. We have a nothing. Um, and and so G can't operate on, on the B. There's no B for it to eat. So we just give nothing. Um, now, if, if F produced uh, a, um, a B, uh, uh, sorry, a T of B, then we can map G to it. It consumes the B. Um, and for each of them, it's, uh, it's uh, producing a, a, a maybe of, of C. And uh, well, for that that single value produces a maybe of C, so we have a maybe of maybe, and we um, we return. Uh, so we have a just of just, and we return the, the inner just. But if G return nothing, then we we also have nothing. Um, for a writer, look, we um, we take F of A, um, and and then we uh, apply G to the value that came out of f of a and we append the two or we minoritally combine the two values to the log. So if this was string from the first and string from the second, we concatenate them. If it was an int and an int, we might add them together if we're operating in, um, in the monoid with plus uh, in natural numbers. For power set, we, you know, we, we uh, apply them successfully and take the union. So here we're, all we're doing is we're kind of um, taking taking this, the result of F mapping G to the result of F and we're joining the results. Um, and it's a, um, it's a thing which does allow short circuiting like with maybe uh, if we can't go on, you know, we could use uh, that accordingly, but, um, but in general, this is, is the form we have. And you see it here with union, for example, because power set was union. We see it here with flattening because mu was flattening. Join here is mu. And there are times we can short circuit it, but um, uh, for example, with either and maybe, uh, but in general, we'll, we'll string them together. And the same thing is true with state down here. Okay, so this is closely composition, and uh, you know I gave some of those examples uh, as before. Okay, um, right, and so I was going to be demonstrating more closely the fact that with closely composition, if you have return, this is the natural transformation um, that takes uh, takes a value and and this is eta, right? And this is uh, some, some other natural transformation F that takes an A and goes to a T of B, um, but return is, is the distinguished pure unit return uh, eta. If we combine it with Claisley composition to we combine it with anything else, we get back that other, other thing. And I was going to try to argue as to why this is here, um, why it has to be that when you do this, that these, these things both equal F. Um, combining F with return on the left or with the right 
gives uh, F back. And it's, it's because combining an identity, uh, an identity morphism in the Kleisi category, this is return. This is unit, this is, um, this is pure. This is that eta. This is eta here for the component of eta for A. This is the component of eta for B. It's a component of eta for C down here. If we compose it with anything else, we get that other thing. Um, okay, and um, I also give bind here. I think we'll have to come back to this to, to finish up next time. Um, so monads, what have we learned today? Well, uh, we learned about, um, we, we learned about uh, product categories. We learned about um, bifunctors as mapping from product categories. We learned about monoidal structure um, that, that categories can be equipped with. Apologies for the English. And uh, when categories are, are equipped with this monoidal structure, we learned what a monoid is in such a category. And, uh, and it consists of these, these mappings and categories of monoidal structure have to adhere to these laws. And then we saw that, that monads, that we could define this category of endofunctors where each object is a functor from a given base category to itself, C to C. Each object there is, a, is, a, is an endofunctor and each morphism mapping from object to object is a natural transformation between said endofunctors. Um, and um, we saw that if we interpret that, there's a monoidal structure associated with that. And that monoidal structure basically says that, um, that we can have monoidal product tensor be composition of these endofunctors. Any endofunctor be, can be combined with any other, just like those loops in the monoids as a single object category can be combined with any other, you could compose any other morphism from an object to itself with, with other such morphism. And we saw that there's a monoidal unit, which is the identity endofunctor. And we saw that with that monoidal structure, the monoids in that category of endofunctors are nothing other than the monads because they're each equipped with two natural transformations. This one that goes from T composed with T to T for a given candidate for being a, a monoid, it needs to qualify, it needs a, a natural transform, a, a morphism from T um, monoidal product, so T tensor product T to T and, and that turns into T composed with T, natural transformation to T. And that's called join uh, for a monad. And, and we saw it also needs one from identity endofunctor, the identity object I uh, for the monoidal structure to, to, uh, uh, to, to T. And that's just a natural transformation in this case from the identity endofunctor to and, and that's exactly what eta is. And we saw that the monoidal laws that, that are required for a monoid, uh, well, are required for a category with monoidal structure and therefore inherited by this monoid are, are exactly the monad laws. Mm. And then we start to go through the, mon the uh, monadic structure with uh, eta and with mu. Um, and uh, for these different functors, and we'll finish it with bind next time. Uh, but uh, we've seen that uh, essentially they, um, they can be combined, they can be described with these different operations. They can be described, all need a return, but they can be described with uh, join or with uh, additionally, uh, or with additionally classy composition or with additionally bind. And um, as we'll see next time, you can define one in terms of the other. Um, uh, you, can, um, you can kind of pick how you want to describe it and um, rest confident that the other definitions of the monads can be, in, can be implemented in terms of that. Okay, so, so that's all for, for, for uh, this for this time. We'll finish up that 
And I think we'll go into applicatives next time. And we'll see how applicatives serve as kind of this, this intermediate point between functors. They're more powerful, more structured than functors, um, but they require less structure than monads. And uh, we'll, we'll see um, that role that they play. And we'll talk a little bit about the practical role that they play within programming as well. Um, because they offer some um, some nice uh, some nice benefits associated with them. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry we went over, but uh, hopefully that uh, provides uh, some some further understanding on the monad front. And we will finish up uh, our immediate immediate foray into that and continue on to. Uh, to applicatives next time, uh, lax minoanil functors uh, and, and how they're used. Thanks very much and have a great day there. Take care there.